Welcome to the Because and Effect podcast. Nolan Bicknell here, and I'm now joined via Zoom by Scott Smith and Jeff Ward. Scott is the Director of Program Development and Quality Assurance at Pulford Community Living Services, and Jeff is their Social Media and Marketing Manager for Pulford. So Jeff and Scott, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Well, we're going to be talking about a lot of stuff, but uh, for people who don't know what Pulford is, I only learned about what Pulford was maybe about five years ago, but the organization has been going since 1986. So Scott, maybe you're, if you want to take us through just kind of what Pulford's general mission is and what do you guys do on a day-to-day basis? Mm-hmm. Well, Pul- Pulford is a nonprofit organization that supports adults with intellectual disabilities in many different services. So often or mostly it's residential services where they have staff supporting them in a home. Uh, We offer day services, uh, supported independent living. We offer these services mainly in Winnipeg, but also in St. Anne, Manitoba, and as well as up in the Interlake in Lundar and Asher in Manitoba as well. Very important work that's being done, obviously, because there are, are groups of people that need a little bit of assistance when it comes to living and when it comes to just sort of keeping keeping things organized but i'm having trouble keeping things organized during covid how has this whole pandemic affected your work because manitoba is really starting to feel you know it's starting to ramp up as as far as severity is concerned so how has that affected your guys's day-to-day life when it comes to dealing with your clients and kind of helping people out well, maybe I'll start off uh, with with services. It's it certainly had a huge impact that uh, we support in a sense a vulnerable population, whether it be medically compromised, um, to live in the community, and it's something of great concern when you see uh, the, this virus kind of run rampant across the province. So uh, early on in the pandemic, there was many restrictions placed on on people. Uh, so uh, government restrictions about access to the community and going out to help limit uh, contact and the spread of the virus. Uh, so it directly impacted their lives where they saw a lot of just everyday rights restricted about access to the community, seeing family. Um, so as it got better in, in the summer, it, those restrictions uh, were lessened. But now that it's ramped up again, sort of in the second wave, we've seen an increase um, to restrictions again so limiting access and and limiting access to families so Mm. it is something that we want to uh balance to ensure people's well-being and and safety because the thing is they are at risk as to having staff come into their home which is very much needed but uh that is sort of the risk that we impose on on the people we serve and but at the same time is um, we want to ensure uh, that their rights are still in place and they still have, um, you know, the same rights that you and I do um, and, and not are missing out on connecting with families. So it, it certainly had a huge impact on on everyone involved in Pulford. For sure it would. And, and, and Jeff, maybe you can speak a little bit to this, but part of this whole... Part of the trouble of this whole thing, with especially with vulnerable populations, is just communicating what the rules are. Because even for us, like we we don't really know what every day things change, right? So, what has been the process of sort of trying to communicate? Here's what the new criteria has to be. Here's what our new processes are going to be, uh, and this is how we got to change moving forward. How, what have you guys done to to try to communicate uh, this new world that we're living in? Yeah, it's certainly uh, like. Frustrating would be the word to describe it, uh, mm-hmm. but it's. I think it's more than that. You know that that kind of only captures maybe just like uh, that we used to do things a certain way and now we can't. You know specifically for the facets of my job. You know sharing the stories of the people we support, sharing the stories of the organization going forward, has been a pretty difficult challenge to overcome. Uh, and you know specifically, I used to go into homes quite often and we would sit down with a person supported and. We would talk about their life and we would either put that in internal communications or we would share it on our social media, make videos and stories like that. And that access now uh, is, you know, severely restricted, you know, for a good reason. And it it should be that way, obviously, uh, to, to protect the people we support. But at the same time, we've been able to pivot pretty quickly into having the staff who are already in the homes uh, and who are, you know, providing that support basically share stories on behalf of the people in the home. So we mm. get 
pictures submitted all the time from staff uh, you know, of, of uh, quarantine haircuts and baking and all of the activities that were being done throughout the summer while, you know, movement was a little bit more restricted. And so to be able to share those stories, uh, I think, has been, you know, the silver lining to a very dark cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to, you know, the, the communication between staff and, and, uh, and, and Scott's level, the executive team, you know, direction from the province, uh, that's definitely something he can speak to uh, a little bit better than I can. Sure. Scott, do you want to, to want to add to that? Yeah. So, um, uh, it, it is, again, uh, we're in new territory. There, there's certainly, uh, unprecedented, restrictions placed on people so again it's still uh supporting them to live their lives in what that looks like uh to have safe ways to connect to the community to do their everyday life whether it be banking seeing the doctors or even seeing their families so uh as well as the introduction of like new technology that um wasn't it was available but it just wasn't in wide use uh, across the agency so whether that's like tablets, video calls like this to connect with their families, we're kind of evolving with the times and providing that opportunity to connect still and live their lives like they used to. What I'm noticing personally is a new understanding with me and my friends and family and everyone of that value of connection because before you could kind of go out and have a beer you could have a you know you could go for lunch with someone and it was you know you could meet a family member for for whatever and now that just kind of disappeared so i'm assuming that in your work you kind of i've heard you say it four or five times already scott that connection and making sure these are these people are connected with their families and connected with their communities so like how has how integral has that connection been in your work and how is that evolving aside from technology and things but how are you continuing to build connection and maintain connection in this crazy new world mm -hmm. well it, it, it's about innovation and, and whatnot so it's um connection is really important we uh in a sense are human services and there's a humanity to that and and when it's just kind of disconnected and cut off it, it, the worry is that that gets lost a, a little bit. So it's the bringing it back uh, in the summer when numbers were lower, were certainly the, the reintroduction and connection personal. Because it is, you know, video calls are nice, but face to face and it is where the real human connection happens. And then that's what we're really about. So we wanted to bring that back as much as possible. And two, it's just navigating to when those connections do happen, they're often with PPE. So mm -hmm. wearing staff mm -hmm. wearing masks at all times and as well as eye shields. And it and, and it's it, there's a, another barrier in between people connecting with people, so we try and just offer opportunities to to connect, do fun things in the home. Um, so uh, oftentimes in the past there would be larger Thanksgiving meals as mm -hmm. we just went through that, but this year we just had to kind of come to ensure that everyone had a meal and had um, uh, sort of enjoyment during that time. It's just a, a sit down within that home itself instead of a larger connection of community friends mm -hmm. and family it was just more intimate sit setting so we're trying to be creative in under the circumstances at the same time as still being safe it's a time to innovate for sure it's so necessary in all worlds right for sure Jeff, tell me a little bit about some of the people you've met, you know, when you get to go and interview people and talk to them and see where, what their setups are like. And like, how inspiring is that for you when you see some of these people uh, in their in their homes and, and, and working in the way that they do? Yeah, it's uh, it's been very it emboldens my work quite a bit. Uh, you know, before uh, interviewing with Pulford a, a couple of years ago, I, I had very little exposure to this sector. Uh, basically just a little bit above zero, right? And so, you know, to go in and, and to talk with the people that, that Pulford supports and to, to get to know them uh, has been, you know, very enlightening. Obviously, there are a lot of challenges and, you know, just to be able to share their story with the world has been really, really great. It's one of the best parts of my job, which is why that this year has been, again, so frustrating because that access to them has been, uh, you know, again, severely limited. But 
it's kind of hard to, which, you know, it maybe sounds bad for my job, but it's hard for me to put it into words how important those experiences are uh, because it can be very, sometimes, you know, you go to work, you answer emails, you're on the phone a little bit, maybe I do a social media post and then the day is over. And so that, you know, am I just kind of getting to the next day to the next day? Well, then there's those times where I get to sit down and, and chat with people that Pulford supports. And, you know, the it's like, time just kind of melts away and uh, you know they're very rewarding experiences for a number of reasons but i think the the most important is that um those opportunities to share their stories these are voices that aren't heard very often you know they are often not given the time in the daylight that they deserve and so it, you know it's almost like being let into uh, you know a, a totally different world, so it's it's definitely quite a privilege. And then of course at the same time to see staff who are working a very difficult job, mentally speaking, physically speaking, these days as well too, uh, you know who are so committed to the work, uh, you know it, it can only light a fire under you. Those are the best days for sure mm -hmm. when you get out and you get to talk to people. You know, like that's why. I wanted to start this podcast and that's I think partially why you started your podcast as well. I yes. mean, there's a new brand new Pulford podcast. Uh, so that's, I'm assuming is going to be kind of one of the new ways that you're going to be telling stories and talking to people and sort of spreading the Pulford good word as it were. But what are some yeah. other ways that you guys are thinking of, of staying connected, telling stories and making sure people still feel heard that, that are your, that are the people that you're supporting? Yeah. And again, certainly the challenge has been, uh, you know, uh, increased, quite a bit you know video production is one of the things that I really love to do quite a bit at Pulford and, and we're very well outfitted for that so you know again in previous years going to homes and shooting video there uh, was the thing to do again that's now quite a bit tougher uh, we still want to do that stuff and I think that again as we hopefully you know start trending back down uh, we'll be able to maybe at the end of this year but you know probably by the springtime next year if things go really well again, getting back in those homes, but really the, the outlet now to tell those stories is, again, having staff bring us, you know, these, right. these really great stories because we can't, we can't be in, in the homes all the time. Uh, Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, there's like around 40 or so homes in Winnipeg that Pulford has? Yeah, oh, um, just over 30 homes just that we uh, support people to live uh, in Winnipeg. Um, that is staff that are there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so it is, it's been, um, uh, a challenging for, for not only the people living in the homes, like we mentioned, but also those staff that, uh, in a sense, put their own health, uh, mm -hmm. on the line every mm -hmm. day that they work as well as, you know, does that bring back to their own household? So we really are thankful for the dedication and the courage of the our direct support staff that uh, come to work every day uh, to do meaningful work. That's mm -hmm. front line. That's as front line as it gets. Exactly. For sure. Um, let's talk a little bit. So Pulford's been in an organization for 34 years since 1986. Uh, Scott, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how work with developmental dis like how have developmental disabilities evolved, you know, our understanding of developmental disabilities evolved? Like how, how has things changed in the last, you know, three decades about how the, the types of supports that people need when it comes to, you know, just helping them with their day to day lives? Yeah. So uh, if we look 30, 40 years ago, um, times were different then that uh, anyone with an intellectual disability or developmental disability uh, were often, um, moved to live in an institutional setting. Uh, we still are one of the few provinces that operates an institution within our province. And so um, in the 80s, uh, it was a time where it was an initiative um, uh, where people were moving out of the institutions back into the community. Mm. It was an opportunity of growth where we've seen a lot of uh, agencies like Pulford uh, be created and um, start offering services, residential services, day services uh, in Winnipeg and across the province. So it's been an evolution of that where they were uh, a certain this uh, the, the population of people were removed from society mm -hmm. to live an isolated life. 
uh, where now we've seen in the last 30 years, um, not just a, a connection and, and participation in, in community, uh, a, certainly an acceptance and understanding that they are as equal to you or I, uh, in, um, and certainly are uh, have every right as any citizen does, um, and certainly bring a lot of strengths and value and skills that are often unseen. And so what Pulford does is empower uh, people to spread that uh, awareness of they certainly can offer um, it just as many things contribute uh, to the community. And that's what we hope that that message gets, uh, you know, seen and heard across the province. You can definitely feel the, the, the lowered level of stigma whenever these conversations happen. You know, people are way more understanding of the ability versus the disability and, and the, the, the empowerment that people get when Pulford has these programs has to be life changing in some cases. So can you talk a little bit about the sort of uh, the mantra when it comes to making sure that you're empowering as opposed to just sort of imposing whatever need, you know, they, they, they happen to need? Well, it was like Pulford's mission is, is to see, you know, an equal inclusive world. So that's what we kind of live and breathe that every day our, from our direct support staff uh, to uh, our executive director, Rod Rettelbeck, that we want to um, uh, just support them to live their own lives. And uh, so we want to find out what that is, listen, uh, help them make those dreams and goals realistic and in, ensure that it, it does happen. So that's sort of the every, in the fabric of everything that we do. And it's important, uh, those things. So um, like one story is we support uh, a, a man um, who his name is Danny and uh, he lives in one of our homes he works and has a paid job. He takes the bus to work and, and, and back. Um, and he has uh, accepted a position as part of our human rights committee. So we have an own internal uh, committee within uh, Pulford uh, around human rights that ensures and empowers uh, people's rights, uh, ed helps educate uh, staff and people supported about their own rights. And Danny is an equal member, a part of that, commu uh, that committee, uh, contributes, um, cool. is a voracious reader uh, and, and uh, studies and researches, different things going on uh, in regards to rights. And so he has helped um, spread that message. And that's what, you know, those types of success stories is what we want to see for everyone supported at Pulford. It's huge. And that's got to be such like a boost for, I know when I, like when I was serving on a board, I was like, Oh yeah, this is, you know, you feel good about it. And I'm sure Danny's in the same, in the same boat. Um, I would imagine another, um, empowering tool is this, uh, this uh, social enterprise that you guys have going as well. Can you tell, like a lot of philanthropic organizations are sort of steering into the direction mm -hmm. of social enterprise, but uh, maybe Jeff or Scott, can you guys tell me about uh, what Pulford's social enterprise is all about? Yeah, so we actually have a, a couple. Um, and, and like the, the main one is is the store in St. Anne, which is a secondhand store. Uh, we have uh, uh, Pulford uh, supports people who work in that store. Um, you know, a lot of sorting and, and cataloging of items and uh, making sure that everything is clean and, and, you know, now enforcing social distancing as mm -hmm. well, too. I mean, it's uh, certainly it's uh, that that job has taken on a completely new tone. No kidding. And uh, for a lot of that work in there, um, you know, there it's it's gainful employment. It's it's opportunities that uh, unfortunately, you know, don't come around very often for for people with disabilities. And, uh, you know, that's that's. I suppose one of the one of the great showcases of the ability of a lot of people we support. We also have, which is now in I suppose a permanent hiatus. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of this year, we started a bakery out in Lundar. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a gentleman we support out there has uh, developed quite a um, a great skill for baking, uh, and in fact, won quite a few awards at the uh, the Lundar Fair over the summer times in previous years as well too. And so we. Uh, myself and my boss Andy Russo, we 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 designed this whole enterprise around the idea that uh, he will offer a pre-order baking service, a handful of items that uh, you know people order and then they they get delivered, uh, you know, at the end of a month. And so every month we were 
well, I say every month for two months only until unfortunately COVID mm-hmm. shut that down as well too in March. Um, you know, we would collect a bunch of orders from the office and then we would go out there and he would bake throughout the day. And and those opportunities, again, it's it's such a great space to show, again, an ability and, and that, you know, that having a, a job and, and, and making money is it's such an important part of our lives and a part of everyone's life. When you meet somebody new, one of the first questions they typically ask you is what do you do? And so it's such a huge part of our identity. And so not to have that, uh, you know, I think while we all maybe fantasize about uh, retirement one day to not to have that piece of your identity is, is a pretty big, uh, a pretty big thing missing from, from many people's lives. So those opportunities are, are things that we want to be researching more. And certainly we're always looking for what could be the next social enterprise. It's certainly hard to try to scale that up and to be as large as the store where it employs multiple people. Uh, the bakery was about, um, I think about a half dozen or so people that got trained on food safe handling courses. And, uh, you know, we, we had this commercial kitchen that we rented and, you know, the whole thing, it took about a year just to get that plan mm-hmm. off, off the ground. And we were only filling about 35 or 40 orders in a month because there simply wasn't enough time in the day to, mm-hmm. to bake anymore. <laughs> so, you know, that's a, a very, very small scale. Uh, version of the store so it, you know it takes a while to get its baby steps it has to start somewhere with one person with with a skill or even just with a desire to be a part of that and uh, and then hopefully you know in 10 years or something we have another one of those on our hands it's about getting people agency at the end of the day right like giving them the ability to control their own life and that's what it's that's what we all want right mm-hmm. that's what we all want I mean my mom had a secondhand clothing store for about 10 years and I know how much work it is like it is insane to be honest like she would be sifting through piles of clothes for days at a time so like that's so much work I can't especially nowadays like people are all about that secondhand life it's pretty sweet (laughs) um so at the end of our time together gentlemen we do a little thing called just because where it's the same seven questions for all of our guests we talk about the causes that you care about and sort of the effect that it's had on your lives and why are you okay to do that for me now sure sure okay good well let's do uh scott first and then jeff and we'll do every question for all of you so i left enough time for for all seven um but scott what's the first cause you actually ever remember caring about the first cause well a good question um uh that's um well, I, I will say the the first time that this uh, sector had an impact on me is uh, sort of late in life, um, where I was working at a at a restaurant uh, and uh, as a dishwasher, and a young lady uh, with an intellectual disability, uh, actually uh, Down syndrome, had come there for a work school program, and uh, the restaurant uh, agreed to do her sort of work placement, but they didn't have the experience or skills to do it. And for me, um, I don't know, I just kind of was struck to say, like, I think I could help her learn skills and tasks and different uh, areas in the restaurant. And so I helped work with her. And um, we, we uh, figured it out. And uh, the the end of the, you know, uh, of the work placement, she went on to get uh, paid employment at a number of different restaurants and uh, was a real success. So for me, I, I just felt um, uh, such a connection in working and supporting people and help them facilitate learning and developing skills. And it really um, just inspired me to kind of do this as a career. Very cool. I think that speaks to the the most important part of, of your work and, and what I assume is the most important part, but it's that, it's that one-to-one human connection. And once you have that experience, it kind of changes you, you see what's possible a little bit because I think a lot of the ignorance that comes from and a lot of the stigma that comes from um, that area of work is that like people just don't have that one-to-one human interaction. So they have all these preconceived notions about what it's going to be like. And then when you actually experience it, it's like, oh, this is actually pretty, you know, it, it wasn't at anything like what I thought I could do. So Jeff, do you have a similar story or what was the first cause you remember caring about or the first, maybe the first time that you got into like why you chose Pulford as a as a career 
Right. Uh, wait, sir, if I'm being honest, uh, I chose Pulford because they chose me. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it was uh, it was an opportunity of a lifetime, and so you know, once once the job was offered to me, uh, you know, I, I couldn't I couldn't help but reach out and and take it. I, the, I think the first cause I really truly cared about was probably the environment. Mm. Um, you know, I, I remember being for some reason excite, excited to recycle as a kid now that would you know it's not very fun or exciting to do now but you know uh i i do remember that being a a very big and still is uh, something that i cared quite quite a bit about uh, and i've definitely become evangelized to pulford as well too i mean it, it's it's I think I'd be bad at my job if I, if I didn't, you know, get on board with the cause and and try to advocate for, you know, what should be just level par treatment of, of people with disabilities, um, you know, and and again, just having now interacted with so many and I'm learning from people like Scott who have a wealth of knowledge, uh, you know, who've educated me a great deal in terms of the Vulnerable Persons Act and, you know, uh, all of the other agencies within the city, but then you know how how Pulford operates uh it's hard not for me for 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 me not to be uh you know so focused on trying to help achieve those goals it's beautiful absolutely so this bring kind of brings us to question two like if money or politics or logistics were no issue at all for you and you could just snap your fingers and something would happen in support of you know pulford's mission what would you do that that you could just make it happen let's go scott first well, I, I think it's just following uh, Pulford's mission is just to help people like live their own lives. And oftentimes funding is a barrier to that uh, uh, access uh, to community, access like fit into physical environments are mm-hmm. barriers to that. So if money wasn't an issue, then you'd certainly put it towards that. So you, the hope would be that every uh, direct uh service professional uh, would remain and stay because it's meaningful work to help uh, and and support and uh, help people live their own lives, that uh, they would have consistent people in their lives that um, are experienced and know them really well and uh, know the person. So when you know the person, you understand their gifts and their strengths and the value that they can contribute to society. And if we were to see that, um, I I think um, it would uh, change society in itself to to see them uh, view people with uh, physical disabilities, intellectual disabilities on equal playing field. And um, that would be a wonderful thing. Beautiful, Jeff, same question. Uh, yeah, I should have went first. I don't really know that I can. Uh, <laughs> That's a tough one. Uh, yeah, I don't know that I could add anything, uh, you know, to what Scott said. I think uh, exactly his points are, are what I would want as well, too. Uh, maybe I would add that it would be nice if, uh, you know, we didn't have to do a lot of the, I guess, uh, educational work at the front of, of trying to have have someone become, you know, an advocate on behalf of us, uh, mm. you know, if 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 perhaps yeah, would, more of that was common knowledge that would be great <laughs> yeah i i'm i'm guessing in 2020 there's there's less of a education gap and, and when it comes to you know volunteers or 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 anyone really when it comes to people with de- de- developmental disabilities but you know i think we've come a long way compared to even 10 15 years ago mm-hmm. i you know when i was in school we you know there was almost no education or knowledge or conversations even about kids that you know we knew something was up but we didn't know really how to deal with it or what and, and, and you know everyone was was kind but we didn't have the the understanding i think that i think in the year 2020 we have a little bit more of so mm-hmm. yeah that's that's a great point uh, so this kind of speaks to what we were talking about a little bit, but question three is what's the biggest misunderstanding or the biggest stigma about the cause? Um, Scott, if you want to talk about that one. Mm-hmm. So I think it's the just the general misconception that um, uh, people with uh, disabilities, intellectual disabilities, can't contribute, uh, that they are unable to even make their own decisions in their lives. And that's part of what the, the Vulnerable Persons Act as a legislation kind of helps empower people to say, uh, it, it kind of starts off with, 
uh, presume competence, that people can make their own uh, decisions, that they do have skills and um, uh, can contribute. And so uh, it, it's unfortunate that it's not widely known that uh, supports uh, and even agencies like Pulford aren't really well known in, in the community in, in Manitoba. And um, but if those uh, you know, if it was a greater, greater awareness, it would certainly contribute to um, uh, a better, uh, let's say, um, knowledge of, of community and and, um, and un a greater understanding. And more opportunity for connection, right? Because, you know, how many p potential connections are going un unmet because people just don't give it a chance or they just dismiss or they're dismissive or whatever the case may be. But yeah, Jeff, what what? What would you say is the biggest misunderstanding or stigma that you've come up against? Yeah, I think it has uh, to do with the with the staff and and the work. I think, uh, and certainly my perception of it as well too. Uh, and I, I wouldn't fault anyone for having this misconception, but uh, that the work is is very similar to that of a nurse or a housekeeper. And while some homes definitely have, uh, you know, medical requirements, I think a lot of the work that I've seen is really just kind of trying to relate to a person, uh, you know, on, on what their experience is. I think it, it's interesting that choice is such a big part of the job for direct service providers. Um, you know, I, I've, this story has been told to me by Scott or this kind of a, maybe a thought experiment, but you know, if you wake up, you know, you choose when you're waking up, you choose what your morning routine is, what you're having for breakfast. I mean, these are all choices that we're making probably subconsciously. Uh, but in institutionalized settings in the past, that's that's all predetermined. You know, you're you're kind of given that path for you. And while that might not seem like, you know, a particularly um, big thing to then be given those choices uh, is is a huge deal. And, and it can be, be quite overwhelming. Uh, so that that work that's being done by staff in homes uh, is is it's very again it's it's quite hard to describe but I, I think that's kind of a misconception that it's more about just you know being somebody's maid or a personal assistant it, it's a lot more than that and it's it's very cerebral in in how staff have to navigate and again just to support the person to live the life they want. The, the decisions they make might not be healthy or, or you know, uh, good for them, but that's their choice, right? And and that has to be, I suppose, honored among all other things. So that would be one of the things that I, I would love to change the misconception around. I'm sure part of the process is educating on what choice, like what the healthy choice would be and saying like, here's your options, like here's what you can do. But it, it's got to be pretty, well, I know it's pretty inspiring to see that empowerment and see those choices being made and seeing, you know, someone's eyes light up when they're like, I get to decide this. It's, it's almost like you, you watching, you know, watching a person become a person. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, question four, what's a time in your lives, in both of your lives, when you had to pivot because plan A wasn't working out. So you had to go to plan B. Okay. Well, I think uh, we're living in those times right now. Yeah. yeah. I put these, I put these questions together a good year ago. So this was pre COVID just so everyone knows. Maybe let's, yeah, let's do a, a non COVID example of when you've had to pivot because plan A wasn't working out. Well, it's hard even to think of times uh, pre COVID, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's always important. And, and when, again, we work with, um, you were really human beings. Uh, oftentimes, we're at the, you know, uh, and and two that are helping them live their lives. That that's where the direction that we're going, and we have to pivot according as such. Um, choices and decision makings are a skill that you and I, in in sort of our upbringing, typical upbringing, have something that we've always had present and learned and developed that skill. Uh, were in um, oftentimes, like Jeff spoke about, people living in an institution didn't get those opportunities, so didn't learn to develop that skill. Um, so just having those um, uh, opportunities uh, to present themselves, develop those skills and learn that uh, is, is important. So oftentimes we'll find supporting people that uh, you don't expect, you know, like they'll do the opposite and then you have to pivot too. But we're 
that's the services that we do offer it has to be flexible adaptable and around the person lives instead of developing services that are they need to fit the mold and fit within it we're trying to build services and, and supports around the person every situation is going to be different right every person's level of comfort is going to be different every person's uh you know you, you have to flex your 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 choice muscle almost and if you haven't been flexing that muscle you're going to be you're almost going to panic when you have a choice to make because it's like well i've never had to do this before like yeah for sure uh jeff what do you think for the same question uh what is the time in your life you had to pivot because plan a wasn't working out yeah, uh, I, I can't I can't go into very uh, good specifics on this because it involves a person that we support and uh, and privacy is important. But okay. we had done uh, a video um, and uh, we wanted them to be a part of it, and they were all set to go. And and then at the end, uh, you know, the day before that we were going to shoot, they decided not to. And again, that's that person's choice. Now, certainly that is frustrating because I, I really, really valued what they had to say. And I thought it would be a really great moment uh, for the video. But ultimately, you know, we had to leave it. And I had to basically find a way around that to get that same feeling, to get that same, uh, you know, the context of, of the lesson that they were going to provide, but without them being the driving force. And so that's, uh, you know, that's that's a really tricky thing to do, especially when the idea is designed around that. Um but I think maybe more personally, you know, the the thing I wanted to do, uh, which uh, would not have been the right thing, was you know, a try to get them back into the video, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, you have to be very conscious about um, am I am I forcing them into a position they don't want to be in, right? And if that's the case, just to serve this video, which has a good message then I have not lived up to the standard of what Pulford is set out to do, the mission, vision, and values of Pulford. If I am, you know, putting the screws to somebody who doesn't want to do something uh, just to get them just so that my project is better, right? And and that's, I'm glad I was talked down off of that ledge mm -hmm. because ultimately I think while the project wasn't as good as it could have been without their input, uh, their choice is their choice and mm -hmm. that has to be respected. Scott, how long have you been with Pulford? Uh, just over two years now, yes. but I've worked in the field for over 20 years. Beautiful. I, I ask because it seems like you're a very patient person, and I think that doing this work, um, not only – it's either great for patient people or else it it makes you be patient, right? Like, Can you speak to that a little bit about, about your demeanor and, and, and how this work has, has maybe contributed to, to patience in a way? Yeah, well um... – I, I think that's in probably a lot of professions that patients, uh, I, I think the biggest thing is just listening. Uh, mm. and, and that's where you're going to hear um, the voice and, and the so wills and preferences, preferences of the people that are supported. It's just stop. It's not about your agenda. It's about theirs. And it's about listening and, and getting that story to come out and, um, so it, it certainly helped and is helpful when working in, in human services as well. Uh, and just people in general, uh, patience is, is always certainly a, a great skill to have um, when, when working with people because uh, in, in, in we can like lots of variety of people in, in, in lot, and lots of characters and, and personalities. And uh, so it just, um, j just being the, the calm presence within that, it helps everybody else them, themselves uh, kind of uh, become calm. Stop and listen. That's very good advice for any, for every job. Like just stop and listen, please. Uh, speaking of advice, uh, question five is what's the best advice that you've ever been given? Scott, do you want to take that one first? Well, uh, I, I know one specifically is, is just, it's about the people. And, and then, um, so whatever situation that we're in, oftentimes, in, in, in again, in, in an organizational setting, Pulford has 420 employees that we employ, uh, that it often becomes about money or people or you know, staffing schedules and, and all sorts of things and conflict is an issue. Uh, and then it really always just has to come down to, it's about the people. And if we just stop and just say, what is their, you know, uh, what's in their best interest? What do they want? Um, it's often the best answer to any uh, resolving any conflict. Yeah, very well said. Uh, Jeff, go ahead. 
yeah, best advice? Um, so back when I was a journalist, uh, the, the editor of the paper that I wrote for uh, said to me, if you listen long enough, um, people will tell you the real story. Now, Ooh. in the context of that situation, it was it was really about that typically when you're interviewing people, the first few things out of their mouth are what they think you want to hear. Uh, and if you have the time and if you have the patience, uh, which I often did not, unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's still a lesson I'm learning, uh, they will tell you the real story if you listen long enough. That's so profound. Yeah, that's so true. And that's great advice. Um, question six, what advice would you give your 10 year old self if you could talk to him right now? Scott? I'll jump in. Yeah. Um, for me, it's a different situation. So uh, I have a beautiful wife, Rachel. Uh, I've met her actually in this line of work. Uh, we've had we have four uh, beautiful children, um, two of which are twins, twin boys, and they are 10 years old. Uh, so on. Wow. Uh, Great question, then. Yeah. Everyday basis, I get to, you know, see them uh, and, and kind of have that conversation. Now, one unique situation is that, yeah, I've had 20 years experience in this sector, but uh, my, um, so the twins are Hayden and Ryder. Ryder is diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. He has an intellectual disability. Uh, he requires a wheelchair for mobility and use. So it hits home for me to have that conversation of what, what would I have with myself at that too. And when you have one with a disability and one without, mm -hmm. it, it certainly has a huge impact. So, um, our vision as a family with my wife is is that um, we want to um, raise Ryder in, in the same way we would our other children, uh, that he lives uh, the same life uh, that his, and has the same opportunities that his brother does, that his other siblings do. And that's important to us. That's what drives us. So this is important to me as a career. It's important to me outside of that at home. And uh, so whether I get paid for this kind of work, uh, I'm in it for life. Uh, <laughs> Very and true. Um, so like our focus is just to ensure that Ryder has the opportunity um, uh, to love others and be loved. And, and that's going to really build and establish the foundation of whatever he does and whatever he wants to do, um, that those are sort of important factors within that. And um, that's the same with all our children. So uh, my work uh, as a father, or I guess uh, my work in, 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 in a career is to build a better future. Um, and it's certainly with Ryder in mind. Beautiful. So that's an important piece. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, what are what's Ryder into? What are they? What are the kids into these days? Well, school, uh, uh, and then at home, uh, he loves. He's got an adaptive bike by Freedom Concepts. Oh, cool. A locally, um, um, a local manufacturer. They're pretty well known across North America. Not, just, but sadly, not as well known in Winnipeg. So he, we're still out bike riding in the cold weather this weekend. Awesome. Uh, he's participated in community sports, whether it be baseball and even soccer. Uh, so he still used a wheelchair to play soccer. They had a little plow put on the front of it and awesome. he played just the same as any other uh, kid and his older siblings helped push him around the field. Uh, so he's uh, again, done the similar things to his siblings had same opportunities and we like to see and continue that in the future. Beautiful. I love it. Uh, Jeff, what, what advice would you give 10 year old Jeff if you could uh, go back in time and talk to him right now? Yeah, uh, I don't know that I would like 10-year-old Jeff very much, so I, I'd probably say something short and sweet just to get out there as quickly as possible. I would say, uh, you know, hopefully learn empathy faster, try to see the world through other people's eyes as quickly as possible. Uh, I think those those two pieces of advice would go a long way for young 10-year-old Jeff. Learn empathy faster. That should be <laughs> just the grade six curriculum. Just yeah. teach the kids empathy faster, as fast as possible. Thank you guys for doing this. Thank you for sharing the stories. Um, thank you, for Jeff, for having me on the podcast, on the Pulford podcast as well. Yeah, thank um, you. Before we ask the last question, can you guys tell, like, what's the plan for, I know you guys have some fundraisers coming up, but how have things changed? Like, what, what, what's yeah. the, give me a, a breakdown of the next, you know, six months for Pulford when it comes <laughs> to fundraising and, and these events that you normally, community events that you guys normally have. 
Yeah. So I guess for context for the listeners, uh, you know, we have a, uh, a fundraiser, a big fundraiser every year called Pairings with Pulford. Uh, 2020 was our, our 10th anniversary, although uh, the unfortunate part was that the fundraiser was at the end of March. And so we canceled that two weeks out. And uh, the, the good news is that so many of our partners and a lot of ticket holders, um, they just turned their ticket uh, into a donation and so we still uh did very very well Beautiful. for our year of fundraising this year uh looking ahead to 2021 would love to have an in-person event logistically and and realistically not entirely sure how possible that is so mm-hmm. it could be online it could be in person it could be pre-recorded video i mean everything is up in the air right now And luckily, we're deciding this, you know, the the board is weighing in on on these decisions, uh, executive directors weighing in on these decisions. You know, we should know the direction quite soon. But then it's, unfortunately, it's we strip everything back, right? Mm -hmm. And and everything now has to be completely bespoke to the current situation. So uh, I'd love to tell you that, you know, on this date next year, we're having a fundraiser. But uh, right now, it's, you know, it's just a bunch of spinning plates unfortunately so maybe uh may- maybe there will be an opportunity to come back on in the springtime next year and and hopefully promote that we will stay connected for mm-hmm. in the meantime people can go to pulford.ca p-u-l-f-o-r-d.ca to support you there's stories on there there's a whole bunch of great resources um so yeah p-u-l-f-o-r-d.ca stay tuned for that but before we say goodbye, our last question of the day for both Scott and Jeff. Uh, what do you guys want to be remembered for? <laughs> okay, I guess uh, ultimately I would love to be on the right side of history. You know, mm. de- depending on whether or not that's in my control, I hope that it is. Uh, I would like to be uh, at least remembered as someone who did the right thing. You know, I think that that's probably what everybody is hoping for. Um, and I would like that, uh, you know, that, that might be harder to do, uh, at some point, but hopefully I rise to the occasion and, and I'm able to do the right thing when it counts. Beautifully said, uh, Scott, last word to you, sir. I think just, uh, first and foremost, a good father, a good husband, um, and hopefully someone that has made a difference in, in the lives of people with intellectual disabilities beautifully succinct well said scott smith director of program development and quality assurance at pulford and jeff ward social media and marketing manager thank you for talking to me today uh it's been great to learn a little bit more about pulford keep doing all the great work that you guys are doing and uh yeah we'll talk to you soon thank you so much thank you